Historians have to have evidence. Well, what kind of evidence do they look for? The best kind of evidence when dealing with ancient periods is to find evidence that goes back to the time itself. If you had some contemporary eyewitnesses telling you how Simon Peter died, that would be brilliant. Unfortunately, you don't have that. You would love, though, to have contemporary accounts written, written the, like the next day from the events. That would be great. Uh, historians would love that kind of thing. Historians would love to have lots of sources. You want to have lots of sources that go back to the time of the events that are being narrated. You would like these sources to be independent of one another. If, if you have 20 sources, but they all got their story from the same guy, you, then you don't have 20 sources, you have one source. You want, you want 20 independent sources who all attest the same, uh, to the same event. Moreover, you want these independent sources to be consistent with one another. You don't want them to be contradicting each other all over the map. You want them to be agreeing with one another. So you want them to uh, corroborate one another without collaborating with one another. Moreover, you want them to be unbiased toward the subject matter. You don't want them to be skewing things in light of their own self-interest. If you're an ancient historian trying to establish what probably happened in the past. What kind of sources do we have when it comes to the Gospels? The Gospels are our sources for knowing about the resurrection of Jesus. Are they the kind of sources that historians would want when trying to establish what probably happened in the past? I think the answer to that question is no. When were the Gospels written? Well, they are not contemporary to the events they narrate. Scholars debate when the Gospels were written, but by far the, the, the most common datings are that Mark was written sometime around 65 or 70 A.D., Luke and Matthew about 15 or 10 or 15 years later, John maybe 10 or 15 years later, John maybe around the year 90 or 95, Matthew and Luke around 80 to 85. These are the dates that are taught uh, throughout the universities and divinity schools and seminaries of North America and Europe. I, th I take them to be right for reasons that I can give you if anybody really wants to know. It's a complicated argument. If these dates are correct, it means that our earliest account of Jesus' resurrection is 40 years after the event. 40 years after the event. Well, Paul was writing before that, wasn't he? Yes, Paul was writing before that. Paul talks about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians. Well, that's 20 years after the event, so that's better. The Gospels give us the narratives. Paul makes reference to it, 20, but there's a 20-year gap. You don't have somebody who is there writing about it. Second point, none of the authors were eyewitnesses. Paul himself indicates that he was not an eyewitness, and none of the gospel writers was an eyewitness. People, of course, call the gospel books Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, they call them Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because we don't know who wrote these books, and there's no point calling them Sam, Fred, Jerry, and Harry. I mean, they're, they're written by people we don't know who they were written by. They are anonymous. You might not think so because they have the title, The Gospel According to Matthew. Whoever put that title on it was an editor later. The original books are all anonymous, written in the third person. Moreover, the followers of Jesus were Aramaic-speaking peasants from Galilee, lower-class men who were not educated. In fact, Peter and, uh, and John in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, are literally said to be illiterate. They couldn't read and write. Of course not. They were fishermen. They didn't go to school. The vast majority of people in the ancient world never learned to read, let alone write. And their native language was Aramaic. These books are written in Greek by highly educated, rhetorically trained writers who are skilled in Greek composition. Probably not disciples and don't claim to be disciples. Where did these authors get their stories from? Well, if they were not disciples of Jesus, they must have heard the stories from somebody who heard the stories from somebody who heard the stories from somebody who heard them from somebody. Stories about Jesus, including his resurrection, had been in circulation year after year after year from the time that his disciples knew that he got killed and believed he got raised from the dead. They told stories to convert people. 
They improved the story sometimes. They changed the story sometimes. The stories got modified in the process of transmission over the course of decades before anybody wrote the stories down. These stories are based on oral reports that have been in circulation for decades. What happens to oral reports in circulation year after year, decade after decade? They get changed. What evidence do we have that the stories about Jesus' death and resurrection got changed? You can read the stories yourself. Simply read Mark's account of Jesus' death and then read John's account of Jesus' death and make a list of everything that happens in both and compare your lists. You will find that there are stunning differences. In fact, there are discrepancies. Let me give you just a list of very quick examples. What day did Jesus die on? That's a simple question. And luckily, we're told in both Mark and John. In Mark's gospel, we're told that Jesus died the day after the Passover meal was eaten in Jerusalem. John tells us explicitly, chapter 19, verse 14, that Jesus died the day before the Passover meal was eaten, on the day of preparation for the Passover. That's different. He couldn't die both days. What about the time? According to Mark, he died at 9 in the morning. According to John, he wasn't, he wasn't condemned to death until afternoon, John 19, 14. These are accounts that differ from one another. Did Jesus carry his cross the entire way to Golgotha, or did Simon of Cyrene carry it? It depends which gospel you read. Did both robbers mock Jesus, or did only one of them mock him and the other come to his defense? It depends which gospel you read. Did the curtain in the temple rip in half before Jesus died, or was it after he died? It depends which gospel you read. I can give you the references for all of these if you need me to, or you can look them up yourself. I'm not making these up. Those are just differences about Jesus' death. What about differences in the accounts of his resurrection? Well, who went to the tomb on the third day? Did Mary Magdalene go alone, or did Mary go with other women? Depends which gospel you read. If with other women, how many of them were there? What were their names, and which ones were they? It depends which gospels you read. Was the stone rolled away before the women got to the tomb or not? What did they see in the tomb? Did they see a man? Did they see two men? Or did they see an angel? Depends which gospel you read. What were they told to tell the disciples? Were the disciples supposed to stay in Jerusalem to see Jesus? Or were they supposed to go to Galilee? Depends which gospel you read. Did the women tell anybody? Or were they silent about it? Depends which gospel you read. Did the disciples ever leave Jerusalem? Or did they immediately, did they never leave, or did they uh, leave and go to Galilee? Depends which gospel you read. My conclusion, these are not reliable historical accounts. There are too many discrepancies. The accounts are based on oral traditions that have been in circulation for decades. Year after year, Christians try to convert others by telling them stories to convince them that Jesus was raised from the dead, and they changed their stories while trying to convince people. These authors were not eyewitnesses. They're Greek-speaking Christians living many years after the fact. They're telling stories that Christians have been telling all these years. There was nobody there taking notes. Some of the stories were invented. Many were changed. For this reason, these accounts are not as useful as historians would like as historical sources. What I've given you so far is really just kind of child's play compared to the real problem of why historians cannot prove the resurrection. And this is what I want to spend my last three and a half minutes on, the real problem. Mike and I agree that what historians try to do is establish what most probably happened in the past. That is the task of history. You can't prove the past. You can only give evidence for the past, and some evidence is more certain than other evidence. All the historian can do is show most probably what happened. What are miracles? Miracles, by definition, are the least probable occurrence of an event. If a miracle was not 
least probable it wouldn't be a miracle. If somebody could walk across your lukewarm, the lukewarm water in your swimming pool, that would be a miracle. If the water was frozen, it would not be a miracle. But if it's lukewarm, I can tell you, none of you here could do it, and nobody in this world could do it. That's six billion people, so what are the chances of one person being able to do it? It would defy the way nature naturally works. I'm not saying that there are natural laws that are written down someplace that you can't break or you get in big trouble. Uh, scientists today don't talk about natural laws, but scientists do talk about highly predictable ways that, that, that this world works. And one of the way it works is that if you are a sentient human being trying to walk across the lukewarm water in your swimming pool, you won't be able to do it. What if somebody could do it? What would be the chances? They'd be, the chances would be infinitesimally remote that anybody could do it. Well, what if somebody could? Okay, let's say somebody could. The chances of them being able to do it are infinitesimally remote. Can you prove that this person probably did it? No, you can't prove it because you can't repeat the experiment of the past to show he did it. That's the problem with history. It's not like the natural sciences. The natural sciences work by repeated demonstration. And so, for example, if I wanted to show you that bars of iron will sink in that swimming pool and bars of ivory soap will float, all I need to do is to get 100 bars of both and start chucking them in. I'll chuck in 100 bars of iron, they'll sink every time. I'll chuck in the soap, they'll float every time. That gives us a predictive probability of what will happen the 101st time. That's how sciences work by repeated experimentation. Historians don't have that luxury. Historians can only establish on the basis of surviving evidence what probably happened in the past, and by definition, miracles are the least probable occurrence or else they're not a miracle. This creates the dilemma for the historian and is the reason why historians cannot prove Jesus was raised from the dead. Historians, by their very nature, establish what most probably happened in the past, but a miracle, by its definition, is the least probable occurrence in the past. The least probable occurrence cannot be most probable. This is the problem with the resurrection. Even if it happened, it defies imagination and cannot be accepted as a historically proven event. Belief in the resurrection. If you believe in the resurrection, it is for theological reasons. The resurrection is a theological assertion about what God did to Jesus. It is not and it cannot be based on historical proof. Thank you.